you know, emotionally, that's your mind and, and, and spiritually, that's your spirit. So all of you now are on empty and, and you can't just get a, a good night's sleep to remedy that. Hello. Hello, sir. How are you? I am excellent, Maria. How are you? I'm great. So good to see you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we love the book. Wow. Wow. Love, love, love. It's such an easy read. And I bet it came from the flow of your alone time, <laughs> because that's kind of actually what I'm thinking about now is it, it feels like it just flowed so easily. Um, and I think that I, I would love for you to share that story of how, how you got to writing, mm -hmm. um, and taking that like, kind of like soul vacation you needed, because a lot of us, we just keep uh, trying to overwill and overwill and <laughs> we're just, we don't listen and we're scared to listen. And when you do so many beautiful things happen. So, so true. You know, I, I started writing the book at the end of 2018, and I got halfway through the manuscript, uh, 25, 30,000 words, somewhere in there. I sent them to my agent, Jan Miller, and she calls me, and she's like, Toure, and I'm like, yes. She was like, this is not your best. And first of all, I'm like, okay, let, let's talk about it, because you know, I discovered that she was both wrong and right at the same time and wrong in the sense that it actually was my best. It was the best based on the state that I was in. But she was right in that she had experienced a better best, a best when I was balanced, when I was in the flow. And uh, and so she was like, I'm calling your publisher. I'm getting you more time and you're going to take time off and you're going to come back and you're going to write a best selling book. And, uh, and I did. Now, I thought that I was just going to doctor up the manuscript, <laughs> but I just trashed it. And it wasn't bad. It just wasn't my best. And, yeah. you know, it wasn't my best best. <laughs> and uh, and so I started over. And you're right. I mean, I, I took that time off. I got what I needed and I locked in and it was just a beautiful journey. And it, and it is a completely different book. Well, explain to everybody what was coming to you? Like you were talking in the book about how your, your body just knew it needed time alone. Yeah. And I think it was your wife that eventually was like, go, right? Was it you? Or maybe I'm confusing uh, authors now. Matthew McConaughey's wife did that to him. <laughs> but there was, there was a moment some in, in there where you were like, okay, I'm going. And you went. Yeah. You, you know, I think that once you create something from this place of abundance, I mean, more innovation, more creativity, more resource than you even need for the project. I know people who experience that in writing, you know, whatever your craft is. I've seen it happen in sports, you know, where you're just like, you're just so full. Your, your channel doesn't even seem big enough to release all that's coming through you. And once you experience that, you really don't want to settle for anything less than that. And, and my agent called me on it. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I found that place. I, for me, one of the things that I've learned is that there's a part of you that knows exactly what you need to do to get to that place. The problem is we don't get still enough to connect with that part of you. You know, you know, I talk about the difference between self-aware and, and being soul aware. I and, can't uh, wait for you to explain this because that was one of my big <laughs> star moments on here. I died when I saw this. Go ahead. Well, it, it's it's self awareness is wonderful. It's awesome to be, you know, to know what you're doing and why you're doing it, and and hopefully make adjustments so that you can have a healthier and more authentic lifestyle. That's awesome. But there's a deeper level. And that deeper level for me is, is that soul awareness where there is the most authentic part of me, the deepest part of me, and it longs to be balanced. It longs to be in that place of perpetual nourishment, perpetual fulfillment. And, and you have to, we have to learn to listen to it, to get down to that voice, to that longing, because if we don't, what we will typically do is we will misinterpret the longing 
of the soul with some sort of physical longing, some, you know, w- w- it'll be about shopping, <laughs> you know, or, or relationship. And listen, I love to shop and I'm big on relationships, but, but sometimes what you need is much deeper and your soul. If you pay attention to the voice of your soul will say, Hey, you know what? You need to stop right now. Or you need to go on a bike ride, or you need to take a walk, or you need to just go and get still and meditate because there is just a a deep awareness of what it needs. And and the only way that we are going to be able to really tap into that still small voice of the soul is to stop, which takes so much courage to do. Tell us why. (laughs) Well, I think that most of us don't believe that we can afford to stop, you know, particularly if you're a high achiever, you know, you've got a lot of people riding on you, a business riding on you, a family riding on you. Somehow we have it locked in our mind that the reason why everything is going well is because we are going, you know, but the truth of the matter is we aren't machines. Mm-hmm. And, and so You know, I always say, you know, some people think that it takes faith and courage to launch out or to start. I think it takes more faith to actually stop and believe that your world is not going to fall apart if you do so. And that's what we think. Like, I can recall times where I so needed, you know, a few days off a break, but I'm like, no, I can't, you know, my team needs me here or my family needs me here, or, you know, my spouse needs me. And I I, I can't, I got to keep going, but here, here in, I was actually depriving them because if I keep spending more than I have, then what I am presenting to them is a bankrupt version of myself that is not helping. And in many cases it's hurting. And so we have to come to a place where we believe that, no, I can afford to stop. My world is not going to come crashing down. The business is not going to go bankrupt. In fact, it might go bankrupt if you don't. I love that. You know, I always say that, you know, eventually like the, the burnout hits, right? Because you don't listen to those little signals along the way. So for me, I look back and I'm like, my God, I was a car on empty, right? And I would like beg someone to spot me five bucks. I put the five bucks in and then I go again and then crash and then go again and then crash. And, you know, we don't really, we don't realize. And I think a lot of us, and this is something I've learned after two brain tumors in my house, is it always usually takes us to have a devastating diagnosis to say, oh, I matter more than all of these other things, mm-hmm. than work, than the accolades, than all of whatever. Because then you realize, oh, <laughs> mm-hmm. it might be over. Or, oh, I'm headed down a really bad path. Or, oh, I'm in a lot of pain. And it usually takes that. So my goal with this show every day was like, how do we, how do we tinker each day with ourselves and get a little better every day so that we don't get to that place and we don't need that diagnosis as let's say as an excuse to look at our spouse and say, I matter. I need to take an hour a day to go do whatever it is. That's going to make my, me feel good. Um, and that's the sad thing. I've talked to so many women, they're oozing eczema out of their bodies. They're suffering in so many ways and yet they won't give themselves even just a little bit. And they're waiting. I said, and I say that to them, I go, you're waiting for something awful to happen, to be able to have the courage Mm. to say, I need help. And it's time for me. And they were like, oh my God. And it hits them. And it's true. So if you listen and you become soul aware and you actually take the steps that you need to, you won't have to take the month off later where, yeah, it's going to pinch a little. Take the day here, take the weekend there, whatever it's going to take. Do that so you don't have to do the other part later. That's so true. I mean, I mean, we're talking about maintenance, you know, uh, I mean, you think about cars, I hate to use the old plate car analogy, but it works, you know, cars have maintenance. And if you do your regularly scheduled maintenance, you don't blow your engine or you don't, you know, whatever it is. And, and you know what else happens a lot of times too, I was thinking about it as you were talking, Maria, sometimes we get a little bit of rest kind of to your point, we Mm -hmm. get that $5, you know, (laughs) gas infusion or, or charge, you know, we're driving electric cars now is that charge and we go and it's, it's, it's tricky because it feels like we're energized, but we know we didn't get still enough to get what we really need. And, um, 
you know, I, I talk about the difference between being tired and being weary. And I think, you know, many people don't know the difference, but you have to know the difference because what you do to remedy being tired is completely different from what you do to remedy being weary. And I think that for me, and I think that the signs of imbalance, um, I think that they can vary from person to person, those identifiers that let you know that you're out of balance. But one for me is weariness. And for me, I define weariness, and this is a dramatic definition. I'll, I'll just tell you right now, it's dramatic, but I wanted it to be because I think being weary for too long is dangerous. But, but I call weariness the subtle gradual gravitational pull down to the tarmac of disaster. Mm. And that's a lot. The subtle <laughs> gradual gravitational pull down to the tarmac of disaster, uh, because that's what happens. Like we, we think that we're just tired, but we're actually weary. And the difference between the two is to, to remedy tired, being tired, all you got to do is take a nap, get a good night's sleep. You know, tired is normal. Being tired is normal. You know, you, you get tired, you go to sleep. We're wired for restoration, our body recovering. But weariness is when you're depleted, not just physically, but you're depleted emotionally and you're depleted spiritually. You are just, you're in trouble because that, all those things are the essence of who you are. Physically, that's that, that's your body. <laughs> you know, emotionally, that's your mind. And, and, and spiritually, that's your spirit. So all of you now, are on empty. And, and you can't just get a, a good night's sleep to remedy that. You've got to work your, your disciplines to get there. And so, um, yeah, I just, um, I think I digress pretty good with that, Maria. But oh, I, but I love I think it. It's, but I think it's, it's just, it's really important to have that regular maintenance so that you don't get to that weary place. And if you do, because we all do, to have an intolerance for it and to know that if I am weary, I'm going to become a different person. My, you know, I'm, I'm going to have slips maybe in integrity. I'm going to have slips in, in patience. Here's the thing. Sometimes someone can do something You're like, how did I, even we can do something We're like, how did I do that? Well, if you're weary, you became a different person. You're not you right now. You, the essence of you is depleted. Mm -hmm. So that's why you did it. Yeah. Well, then you're in your lowest form. So you're going to make your lowest form choices. Yeah. And, and that's not even, you know, that's, it's kind of out of your control at that point until you, <laughs> you know, until you restore. So how does one become more soul aware? Mm -hmm. I think that it is doing, as I mentioned, one of the hardest things, and that is to stop. So th th I, I think that people could be more soul aware than they are if the world wasn't so noisy, like life is noisier than it has ever been. And what makes it so dangerous is that noisy has become normal. Like it is, it is like to stillness now is actually, it's almost unnatural. <laughs> you know, it's almost like it's not normal to be in stillness. That's why when we do have these moments where we get still, we're fidgeting and, you know, I need to do something. Wait, I feel like I'm doing something wrong because I'm not doing anything. No, you're actually postured to come to a place to where you can become aware of what's going on with your soul. Um, I think also, I think that some people are afraid of what may be what they feel may be discovered um, about themselves if they pause and get still enough to really acquaint themselves with themselves. Um, and so uh, so that so what we have to do in order to become solo or the first thing we have to do is we have to stop. And I'm not talking about a quick little stop. No, I mean a real intentional, uh, I believe it ought to be daily uh, time to get still. Yes, I know you've got that meeting. Yes, I know you've got this deal that you're pondering. Yes, I know that you've got your kids pulling at you and wanting things and you have to meet with teachers. Yes, I get it. I know all of those important things are front and center in your life right now. But 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 you are the most important person in your life. And and you have to say, you know what? I need this 30 minutes, this 1 hour or whatever to get still, to, to, to silence everything. You know, I have, um, you know, I believe in meditation and meditation has a number of different definitions and forms and, and that's wonderful. 
Uh, part of my meditation is to get still, but then I also have things that I have written out. I have I am statements that create an environment for the truth about myself to emerge. Um, and I do it every morning. I, every morning, bef- even before I, I kiss my amazing wife, you know, I, I I have to connect with who I am because honestly, I want the best version of me to greet her. I don't want, so I want to, I'll get up typically before her and I'll go, I've got a little place that I go to and, and I have my little routine and, and, uh, and I get still and I discover myself all over again in stillness, the truth of of who I am, the truth of, of the, the, the purpose and the plan for my life. I get rid of all of the limiting beliefs that just no matter how enlightened you are, they're always nearby, <laughs> you know, mm. waiting for you to slip in your disciplines. I make sure that none of that is there. Um, I connect with my soul. What I know I've got this thing on my calendar, but what does my soul need today? Um, and then I emerge from that time, you know, I'm connected and then I can greet my wife and, and, and my children and, and, you know, and greet my staff and everyone and, and give them the version of me that they deserve. I love that. I, um, I feel like a lot of partners should really be, oh, let's, how do I say this nicely? Be like Kevin. Um, so my husband, (laughs) I was dealing with my mom who was battling brain cancer for five years. And that was a miracle by the way, because you get six to 12 months generally. So we were in miracle mode, but it was a long, long journey. And I was giving my mom, 200% every day. And I was exhausted. And anytime those moments hit, he would take the burden of everything off of me and let me rejuvenate and let Mm. me rest. And I think that, you know, especially for women, we rev so much higher. We're worried about so many people. We're never just worried about ourselves or, or one thing that we have, whether it's work or not. We're wired so differently. So, um, for the benefit of any of the men listening, it is really, really helpful to help us help us <laughs> because we generally don't know how to do that. I feel like guys have a much better system where they know, like my husband, he's like, if I've got the bowl of cereal and I'm in bed, don't bother me. That's my time. And I know that. Right. So I feel like guys generally are better about like, I'm watching sports. This is my meditation. Mm-hmm. Women don't really have that. We're just like, just always doing and little, you know, busy bees everywhere. Um, but everything you're saying is, is really true. And the noisiness was really uh, powerful when I was reading that and, and how awkward it is to have silence now. And, and you see it in our everyday behavior. The second you're not engaging with someone or engaging in something, you got to get on your phone because it's so awkward. We don't know how to be without it. And those are the little practices you can do every single day to just say, no, no, no. As Dr. Joe Dispenza says, tame the beast, tame the beast (laughs) that doesn't know how to be alone. And every time you make that better choice, it's going to lead to another better choice. So do the baby steps. I love the idea of having a 30 minute or an hour window a day where it's just you and you're alone, which I want to talk about all own, uh, all one or alone as well. Uh, because it is very uncomfortable. I've had to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And one of the things that I've been really being um, compassionate with myself about is scheduling less things in a day. Mm -hmm. And for an overachiever, it is really hard to feel like you're accomplishing if you're like, I only did like one or two things today. That's so not enough. But it is enough because when you have these blank spaces that's when things can happen. That's when new ideas can percolate and come in. That's when, you know, I, I had a woman, uh, a doula who was working with me back in my like crazy, crazy busy days. And she's like, Maria, baby can't come. There's no room. You're so overscheduled. Mm. There's no room for a baby to come. Wow. And so I really believe in that. And it's been a, a hard journey to get to the place where I'm like, 
okay, well, this is it. And guess what? I feel good. So if I feel good, then I'm going to be good. I'm going to, I'm going to be healthy and I'm going to be my best version wherever I go. So then if I go to one thing and I'm this version of myself, how many people is that going to affect and how much more is going to come to me later rather than when I was like, I remember the days when I would show up and I'm like, Oh my God, you don't understand. I had this and this, and then I ran from here and there. And now I see people doing it to me and I'm like, (laughs) just no, 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 we'll get together another time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's all good. You seem really stressed out. Just stay over there. (laughs) Please don't bring that into my vortex. But you don't ever see it until you start to do it and get comfortable with the uncomfortable. So Mm -hmm. one of the things we're very uncomfortable with is being alone. And that was a really powerful part in the book that I really loved. So if you can share that with us, that would be great. Yeah. You you know, when you think of the word alone, um, if you just hear it, for the most part, it almost has a negative uh, stigma to it, if you would. For example, if you go to, you know, a restaurant and, uh, and you're there with your friends and you guys are having a great time and you look over and you see, you know, some guy in the corner or some lady in the corner and they, they're over there sitting down, having dinner all alone, all, all by themselves. And you almost want to strike up a conversation, do them a favor, break up their deprived state of being alone <laughs> with your presence. I love this. You I know? was screaming. I'm like, that's me. I would feel bad for that person. <laughs> you know, Because we, you know, we love people and we get it, but that word alone in it, and it's, you know, the original middle English word for alone, was actually a phrase and it was the phrase al-ana, which means all one. And so, so to be alone was never meant to be this, uh, this space for one to pity someone else. It was actually the opportunity for people to become all of themselves. And when I think about it, even when I go away, and I try to get away for two or three days every six weeks or so, in that environment, listen, I alone? love my wife. Alone, completely mm. alone. Might have to start implementing this. There are some things that happen to me in that environment, this Aoana, this uh, alone environment that can't happen to me in group settings. Now, in group settings, you know, it's great, awesome things happen in relationship and community, but th- but some of the most development that I've ever received, personal development that I've ever received didn't happen in a group. It didn't even happen in therapy. Although I've had great breakthroughs in therapy, some of the really life-changing epiphanies came when I was with myself, you know, out on a, um, to become all oneself, you know, oftentimes we are fragmented. We're, we're a little bit of us. We're a little bit of whatever, you know, social media tells us, you know, we're a little yeah. bit of that. Well, and you get a compromise be, with other people, right? You got to give time. a little of yourself up to their needs. It's never just about you. Yes. And that's the, I've learned that that is the space of development, but it's also a very hard space to be in. Uh, I remember a time when I was, I had gotten out of a, a long-term relationship and I had, I hadn't been single for years. And, uh, and I knew that coming out of this relationship, I needed to be by myself. I need to be with myself, by myself to grow, to do all the things that take place when you are not distracted by other people. And I couldn't, I just, uh, I found every excuse to bring others into my life and my world. And all that was doing was pushing back my healing. It was pushing back my transformation. It was pushing back my growth. And so finally, and I knew it, you kind of know it, but you just are so ad- addicted to people and afraid of being out on a, you know, that you make these types of choices. And it wasn't until I finally said, you know what, I am going to be by myself that the, a better me emerged. And, um, it was really interesting. So it's hard for people. Um, it's challenging. There's a number of reasons. Some people, believe it or not, don't know if they like themselves. They they haven't spent enough time just with themselves to know if their relationship with themselves, you know, is is worthy. It's really interesting. Um, you How know, do you talk explain about self- that? How do you explain understanding or even knowing whether you like or love yourself? How do you find that? Because I just found it at a meditation event. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I haven't loved myself. Oh my God, it was the hugest epiphany. 
And then Mm. when I had that realization, my heart was just exploding. But I would have never felt that if I didn't go to this event, completely shut off devices and just immersed myself. And I'm still trying to figure out how to communicate that. And because this is what you do, Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder if you have a good way to explain it. I hope so. I think I think being with yourself is the environment to really discover yourself. And when you discover yourself, you will know pretty quickly whether or not you like you. Um, paying attention to the self-talk. What what are you saying to you? I can recall um, I had this habit of every time that I did something wrong or I thought that I could do something better, I would literally say this. Tere, what's wrong with you? I'm call, I'm talking to myself like, come on, Tere, you know, and 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 I had to recognize that hey, there's a there's a part of me that doesn't like me. There, there's a part of me that is judging me. There, there's a mm. there's a part of me that thinks less of me than you know, the, the period that thinks less of me, and uh, and so in that environment of being alone and being with self, you can detect your relationship with yourself, you know, and, and that is a relationship that I I personally believe that your relationship with self is the basis for every other relationship you have, particularly, you know, all of your external relationships are a reflection ultimately of your relationship with you. So I, I believe that the most important relationship in my life is my relationship with me. And so um, being by myself paying attention and taking inventory of how I think about myself, how I talk to myself, how I treat myself is how I come to dis- come to discover the, the health or the lack thereof of my relationship with self. And from there, um, if I see areas that need to improve, I have to begin to work on them by incorporating truths about me that don't judge me, but that love me. Listen, if you don't love you, <laughs> you know, how can you expect anyone else to, you know? Yeah. Well, there's uh there's the whole if you hate others, usually you hate yourself. If you judge oh, yeah. others, that means you're judging yourself. So another easy way to kind of spot it is how are you thinking about others? Maybe you can't catch your thoughts about you, but you can catch your thoughts about others when you start to judge and you start to hate, you start to get jealous and all these kind of negative emotions about other people is usually because you're thinking those about yourself. That's really good. So true. So if you spot yourself doing that, then you have to go in and do the internal work. And then, like you said, pay attention when you're looking in the mirror. Am I judging every little thing, every little wrinkle, every little this or that? Wow. And then if I am, then it's like, oh, I need to find a new relationship with myself where I can be accepting. How do I do that? So then what is the next step? How do you start to love yourself? Mm -hmm. First of all, what you just said is profound. Uh, I just want to respond to that about paying attention to how you see others uh, is a reflection because you're right. When you, and I'll talk about how to get there, but when you love you well, um, and you live in the environment of, you know, of self-love, you know, I'm a spiritual man, so I believe in divine love, you know, which I think is, is really one of the keys to self-love. If, if I am divinely loved, you know, a perfectly divine being formed me, created me, fashioned me, thinks that I am worthy of bringing forth into, into being birthed, then how can I now <laughs> not love me? Uh, but anyway, when I'm in that state where I feel loved, when you think about that, that's when there's no jealousy because you're complete. You're like, good. All you really need is to be loved completely and entirely and radically for who you are. And when that happens, it, you're right. It cures you from not just self-judgment, but the judgment of others. And so I, when you said that, that was just so spot on and it resonated deeply, uh, that point about paying attention to how you're looking at others. Uh, but but I, I think that, you know, I think to, to be alive, I think to be taking up air and taking up breath 
is affirmation. I, I think you and I here having this conversation, um, talking about higher things and 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 becoming better, is a gift. I, I think that this is life itself is an affirmation of us being divinely loved. Uh, that we have opportunities in this moment to 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 love, uh, to grow, to ponder, to reflect, to create. I believe is a sign that we are divinely loved in this moment. Now, it doesn't mean that if we, you know, if we transition, we're not loved. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm talking about the moment that we're in right now, the moment that each of us are standing in. Um, I think it speaks to how we are loved. We have a another chance, you know, right now, regardless of where we've been or, you know, what we've lost or maybe some of the things that we might regret, regardless of any of that, here in this moment, we have breath, we have life, we have our, you know, cognitive faculties, we have our our soul, our spirit. That says, I love you. That's that's someone somewhere saying, I love you. Mm -hmm. I also love this other practice, and I'm sure you've you've, uh, done this, is if you can't figure out how to love yourself, go back to your younger you, because it's hard not to see your younger you and be like, oh my God, she's so cute. That cute little chubby, <laughs> whatever. And, and, and wrap your arms around that like younger self and say, I got you. I love you. Um, that was another thing that was helping me in my kind of journey to loving myself. Mm. Um, because you would never let anyone hurt that little baby. Mm. You would never let anyone talk nasty to that little baby. And so why would you do that to that little baby? Wow. And wow. so if you can start to think in those terms, you can start to form, I think, a relationship with yourself in that way as well. And the other mm-hmm. thing that I've been doing now is, and this came to me in a meditation where I realized, oh my God, I have not loved my brain. I have lo- not loved my body. I have not loved my heart. I have a huge heart. Why am I expecting other people to see my heart if I don't see my heart? Mm. I'm just, Mm. I'm doing it. I'm doing the practice, but I'm not internalizing any of it and feeling it. So I started the practice of saying, I love you brain. I love you heart. I love you body. I love you, Maria. Mm. And so I do that every single day. And I mean, I know that the benefits are explosive for me, so I can only imagine... Um, if other people apply it, how they would feel too. That that's powerful. Y- you know, you mentioned that that um, that child, and here is the thing: we're still that child. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not we we feel like you know where did that child go? That child is still there. Uh, they have just had life pile up, mm-hmm. you know, and experiences pile up. And when you said that, it just I started looking back at myself, um, you know. I remember the first time uh, I, I grew up in, well, I didn't grow up, but I started off in Oakland, California. And my, um, you know, my mom didn't have a lot of money. She was, you know, college student and I, I didn't, you know, my, her and my dad weren't married. You know, she was a single mom. And I remember she bought me this red bicycle and, and I rode, I was five years old, four or five. And I rode my little red bicycle to the store. And went to the store and got, you know, whatever nickel candies I can get. And I came back out and my bike was gone. Someone, we were living in an in inner city in Oakland and someone had stolen my bike. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was devastated because I did not know that bad things happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was so like, I mean, today, you know, we go to some neighborhoods and some, I mean, you go to anywhere, you lock your car door because you have the awareness that everywhere, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is what it is, but, but, but it took me back to how was I before that happened to me? Cause that did shape me I, from, from there on. It's funny. I recall that incident happening at nighttime but it actually wasn't nighttime because I wouldn't have been out at night. So it was during the day, but my whole world was recolored by that experience and it became night in my mind. But, um, but who was I before that happened? 
And uh, I love, I, I just, I, I didn't want to skate over that point about when we're talking about self-love and really going back to that, that, that child and that child, that little boy who was innocent mm -hmm. and riding his bike and enjoying his bike and going to the store to get his candy or whatever, he's still in there. And, uh, and maybe it would behoove me to spend more time with him. Yeah, I think so. Well, I also had another vision when we were just talking. It's like, there's the little, little one, you know, those, like those, um, I don't know what those, those wooden dolls, the, the little Russian dolls, the little Russian collapse, dolls, they, yeah. they keep, mm. there's like the little one, then the medium, then the large, and, and then they just, they can all fit into one. That's us. So mm -hmm. it's like the little baby, mm. the one-year-old, the five-year-old, the eight-year-old. And so it's all, we're all in there. And I think our job is to keep healing those different layers mm. so that we can become whole because that's where, you know, all those moments, the, the bike being stolen, you know, whatever happened from there, we so focus, we're, we're trained to focus on all the negative, right? Because we have to protect mm. ourselves. So we're trained to focus on the negative. So then that's all we kind of feel. So the more we heal those different layers and acknowledge them and go back into them, the more we're going to start to feel more like our true selves because we can delete a lot of that um, cause it's, it's really the emotion that we're remembering and we, our recollection is only 50% correct because we <laughs> embellish whether we like it or not. It's just the human memory embellishes, right? So for you, your world went darker. It was like, I yes. just had a Batman reference. Everything just got dark, mm -hmm. right? Because now you have to be afraid. You learn that you can't just be pure energy and just, you know, Holly go lightly floating around life. You're going to get hurt. But yeah. if you if you look at it like that and start to realize, okay, I can I can heal all of these different layers. I can go back to each one of those versions of me and say, that's not me anymore. That was mm -hmm. then. That was that Maria. That was that Ture. But I've I've survived it. I've gotten past it, and I've kept growing. So maybe I don't need to keep staying attached to all of those feelings. Maybe mm -hmm. I can create new feelings. Totally agree. Totally agree. So cool. Um, I want to talk about fear-based decisions. I feel like we've covered a lot of really cool topics, but fear-based decisions I was flipping out about in the book. And, um, and, and I really want people to hear a little bit of what you talk about. It was like page 58 and 60, I know. Um, and I was, I was just so excited to hear about it because we all, a lot of people will say nothing good comes from making a decision from fear, but how do you not come from fear? Right. My husband was always like, all right, we operate from worst case scenario. I go, honey, you got to read his book now. <laughs> um, so I, what he likes to do is figure out what the worst case scenario is, realize it's not so bad. And then you can move forward without it. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but talk to us a little bit about how fear keeps you from balance. Yeah. I mean, there, there is a worthy argument about fear and whether it helps you or it hurts you. The, those who argue for fear that it is, you know, somehow productive argue that, Hey, when you're afraid, you know, you have an awareness you know, there's an awareness that comes over you and you're able to detect uh, a threat and potentially respond to a threat, et cetera. And, you know, and I can appreciate that argument. The other argument, which is one that I argue is, I think it hurts you only because when you ruminate on something negative and fear obviously is, you know, it, it is negative. It is to believe to, or to suspect that something bad is going to happen to you. Um, although it might make you aware, you are spending energy, cognitive energy, creative energy that you could be using to build, to, to move forward, to innovate, to create, to progress. Now, the, the, best, the best of you is being channeled toward a scenario that may not even be real. It may not ever even show up. And so, uh, you know, I know some people who are extremely uh, successful, you know, and all the things that go along with being uh, extremely successful, mainly wealth. 
And, um, but they're afraid, you know, they, they aren't successful because they are running toward the abundant opportunities that exist or that are before them. They're actually running from an idea of not having enough. Mm -hmm. And so you might say, well, Hey, no matter how they get to success, you know, what's the issue, whether they're you know, running from something or running to something, what does it matter as long as they are successful? Well, my belief is that they could be so much further if they were running without the weight of fear and negativity, you're out running, you're looking behind you, trying to outrun a boogeyman that's not even there. Well, what could you bring to your endeavor if you weren't running from, but you were so enamored by the reality of the abundance that's in front of you that you freely brought all of yourself to your pursuits. And so the so my answer would be, yeah, they're successful, but I believe they could be exponentially more successful if fear wasn't in the driver's seat. That is a Kelsey's like, yes. <laughs> Do you have something you want to say? That's just <laughs> it makes so much sense. Yeah. I know wow. that fear held me back so much because it just wasted my energy reserve. So what mm. I've realized recently is like, here's my energy reserve for the day. And I wasted it on fear, worry, stress, frustration, annoyance, anger, until I was depleted. And then I needed another coffee by two o'clock. And then I, mm. I, that was still not enough. And now I, I literally abandoned all of those. I realized oh my gosh, I've been doing this for so many years and none of it's ever come to fruition. None of the things I worry about and why was I worrying about so many things? Um, it was, it was really stupid. Even just like scarcity, right? Growing up hearing, we don't have enough. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. That became something I embodied. Mm. It wasn't true to me. I had plenty. I, my parents paved the path so that I could go become successful. And so I looked at my husband, uh, this is a stupid story, but uh, it just kind of illustrates it a little bit. I came back from this meditation event and I see two hats on the picnic table outside. And I was like, look at him, has to have two. One isn't enough, he got two. Because I would barely buy the one, right? Because I would be like, oh, I'll just skirt the sun. I don't know, I'm a crazy person sometimes. And I go, you know, two. And I said, wow. Here I have been all these years afraid to spend. He never has. And we're in the wow. same place. I've made myself ill, created autoimmune conditions, all because of stuff that doesn't even exist, of things that not, are, have nothing to do with me. These scarcity issues, these fears, these worries, these, you know, living in all the past stuff. He wasn't doing any of that. He's just fine with his two hats. <laughs> it's crazy when we really see how we're using our energy source every single day to work against us, not for us. So now I'm reversing all of that. And I was able to really abandon it, which I'm really proud of myself. I woke up this morning. I go, really? Like none of these things even come into my existence anymore. This is crazy. Wow. How much more it's going to propel me forward? Because as you said, if you're coming from fear... You're, you know, it's like, it's a real outwilling you have to do. You have to really move a lot of matter to get to where you got to go. But when mm -hmm. you can flow, everything's so much better. And then so much more will come. At least if you're, even if it's just your inner happiness and your inner peace. But exactly. more comes from that. Which is priceless. I love how you, and it's, this is common knowledge for, people like yourself and myself who study uh, who we are spiritually, um, but we are a limited resource. We, we really truly are. It, it's, it's when you begin to recognize to your point that we only have a certain amount of energy in the tank, we become very technical and very intentional about how that is spent. And we just recognize that fear is not a good investment. It's just not a good investment of energy. Now, I don't mean you know you shouldn't be aware and you shouldn't be concerned and and or not concerned, but but you shouldn't be. I believe that you should be aware. You shouldn't be oblivious 
to potential risks and various things. Mm -hmm. But how much of yourself are you going to give to that? How much of your thought life are you going to give to it? And so I, uh, I, I kind of realized over probably the past five years that, you know what, Ture, you are a limited resource. And because you're a limited resource, you have to pay close attention to your thought life. You know, um, you know, I, I talk about how I, I see my mind as real estate, like prime real estate. Just think of the most prime real estate. I don't know, Monaco, whatever, wherever, but just the most prime real estate you can imagine. That's how I see my mind. And therefore, I am careful about what I allow to take up space in it, to take up this is precious real estate. And um, and so I think that that self-awareness, soul awareness is, you know, is mining, minding what you're minding, like what, wait, what's going on? How much is this costing me? You know, I'll, I'll find myself in a moment and I'm thinking, you know what? This conversation is expensive. This is like I didn't expect. <laughs> I love that. I, this is expensive. I, this is this is more. This is more than what I budgeted for. And so it seems like we're not going to really get anywhere. Yes. And therefore, remove uh, yourself. I'm, yes, I'm going to excuse myself because it's because now you know, and you know it because you start. There's this tax that comes. And you're like, uh oh, wait, I, my tank is dropping. And so, yeah. so I it, this whole. Thing that we're talking about really helps me in the way I approach life every day. I love that. I feel like that's when you're really in tune. Like I'll have conversations with people and it's usually about stuff like this. And when you see them starting to look around, I'm like, oh, I'm out. Like there's just, it's not connecting. It's not resonating. I'm not wasting one more second of my breath. And by the way, friends, if you're in this situation, that's when you have to go to the bathroom. It's the easiest way to get out. Oh my God, I have to go to the bathroom so bad. Excuse me, we'll continue later. And then you just leave and you just go protect yourself because we are limited. However, I wonder what you think about this. As you were saying that, I'm like, I do feel if we're in like complete harmony and balance, we can be unlimited. That's mm. where we are unlimited, but we are mm -hmm. so limited in how we use the other stuff because if yes. we're in balance, everything's full. You are unlimited. That cup hasn't come mm. down. The water is still at the top. I'm about to scream over here. I mean, <laughs> you, you are just <laughs> you are just hitting it. Absolutely. It is abundant. There, there is an abundance. And you're right. It, it is when we are in harmony, when we are in balance, everything's flowing. Everything is there. I mean, our resource will literally out, outspend us, to be honest with you. Yeah. I feel like we're really like in a good sync today. This is really feeling so yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> you guys could talk forever. Like, <laughs> I feel like we're like the twin towers, just like, <laughs> shoom, like just in such a good kind of resonance. Um, this was such a great conversation. I feel so alive and mm -hmm. so good. And I feel like our, our heel squad is really going to love all of these, um, these tidbits, we didn't get into the, the signs were in imbalance, but I don't think we need to go there because we're teaching people how to be in balance instead. <laughs> mm -hmm. I am so, so great, uh, grateful that you came in today. And, um, and I love the book again, friends, it's called balance. Uh, we will link to it in the summary of this episode. Um, and we'll put, uh, Trey's Instagram in there as well and his website. So thank you. Thank you. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.